Similarly, Berger again in 1984, and this is um, the Berger that we've got the research from already in most of the Thrive books, found that persons high in the desire for control, who generally perceived that they did not have control over the events of their lives, were more likely depressed, to be depressed than those that had were low in desire for control. So there's a strong link between if, if I haven't got the amount of control I want, if I've got a strong desire for control and I haven't got that control, I'm going to get depressed. I have that learned, helps and that learned helplessness, that depressive reaction to that. Going back to the dogs a minute. The dogs which were exposed to the random shocks were both external and helpless. Only after being physically forced into realising that the situation was not futile did their internality and skill set increase and they started to look for and find a way out. The dogs that were pre-trained to not become helpless didn't. They just carried on searching for resolution to their very challenging situation. Again, in our parlance, generally speaking, people want an internal locus of control and an average to strong desire for control. You've got to have a desire for control. You, you, know, you won't ever get out of bed in the morning. You won't be successful in life without some desire for control. Desire for control, per se, isn't a bad thing. But the more the desire for control gets stronger, or the more external the locus of control becomes, the more stress and anxiety or depression or helplessness the person is going to create. If you have a very strong desire for control, if you're a bit of a control freak, and are more than averagely external, then life's going to be very stressful for you. You're going to attempt to control everything in a vain attempt to avoid physical or emotional pain, and you'll fail miserably. Feel even worse, feel out of control, and then, of course, attempt to get even more control. And the more control you attempt to gain when you haven't got any, the worse you're going to feel. Generally speaking, if people cannot control their own emotions, they try to control other people and events. And that was Robin Skinner. Robin Skinner, if you remember, was the psychiatrist from London that wrote a couple of books um, with John Cleese, your man out of Monty Python. Now, what we can do is look at this in relation to the crazy hot matrix. No, not really. I downloaded that by mistake because it looks very much like the actual picture that I made, which was this one here. So actually, I think this is a really good diagram, a really, really good picture. So if you look on the left-hand side, you've got the desire for control um, scale from 0 to 10, as per the questionnaire in the book. And along the bottom then, you've got the locus of control or the sense of power and control as identified by our quiz going from 0 to 30 and if you see the green area the green area the green area is the ideal situation to be in you've got a locus of control score of less than 10 so you're, you're very internal you've got a good internal locus and you've got some desire for control somewhere between two and six You've got a desire for control, you want to do something, and you're internal. That's the most successful area, if you like, to be in. The, the general yellow area, okay, um, it's not necessarily too bad uh, by itself. Um, but when you start moving into the orange, and then the more red, and the very red, that creates big difficulties. If you've got someone, for example, that scores between 25 and 30 on their locus of control score. And then they've got a desire for control score between, say, 8 and 10. That puts them in the right top hand, right hand corner, that deep red area of the diagram. And this is your classic anorexic, ME, post viral fatigue sufferer, someone with OCD, you're a metaphobe, uh, sometimes you're perfectionist. If you've got an obsessive perfectionist, they normally go there. And this is why they're so controlling, or this is why they attempt so much to gain control, is because they want to be in control so badly, but they've actually got no control. They absolutely believe that life is happening to them. They believe in uh, um, fate, luck and chance. They believe in social anxiety. They believe they're powerless. They believe in significant others. They believe that life happens to them. 
they're superstitious or they're, they're fatalistic or they believe in God or they're spiritual. So these people want control but haven't got any control or rather don't believe they've got any control. So they're creating anxiety all the time. Almost every thought is creating anxiety. If you think about some of the emetophobes we've talked about in recent months, and if it's true that we have somewhere around 60,000 thoughts a day, the metaphobes that I've spoken to reckon that you know somewhere between 90 and 95% of their thoughts every day are either directly or indirectly related to their metaphobia. If that's true, then that means somewhere around 55, 57,000 thoughts a day of about wanting to be in control, wanting to get control, feeling powerless. It's no wonder they feel wretched and unhappy and stressed and anxious most of the time. So this is a really good diagram. I'll upload a printed version of this so you can print it off and, and keep it with your session notes. It's a really good example. You can actually plot someone on there. If you currently score 15 on your locus of control quiz, let's say, and you've got a desire for control score of six, then you're just inside that orange area. You are going to have problems. That's not a good place to be in. It's nowhere near as bad as the red or the deep red, but that orange area is not a good position to be in. You want to get right down into the yellow, ideally right down into the green. Somewhere in the green is where you want to be. So if you imagine then that here you are standing by a river, you've got to get across the river, but the water's deep. And you've got a number of options open to you. What can you do? You can you can um, jump in and risk it, and you can swim across the river and take that chance, take that risk. Or maybe if you don't want to take that risk at all, what you could do is use the boulders on the bank to build yourself a little pathway across it in some way, shape, or form. So the difficulty is then, if you take that risk, if you let yourself get outside your your desire for control and you take that risk and you manage that risk and you swim across the river when you get to the other side you feel grateful you feel proud there's a lot of positive reinforcement that you've opened yourself up you've taken a risk you've exposed yourself to this potential risk and these emotions and you've been successful so actually you grow in your confidence you grow in your skill set Imagine this was a, a social situation and what you've done is actually you've stood up at a conference and given a talk. And then you've gone down and sat, sat back down again and you process it well. You think, you know, I really did well then. I talked. I didn't die. No one did laugh at me. It was okay. I did really well. You've grown tremendously there by exposing yourself to the difficult or the feared situation. You've grown immensely from that experience. If, however... You're the person with a hugely strong desire for control and you are unwilling to allow yourself to be exposed to that experience and instead you find a way around getting across the river. Yes, you might get to the other side, but actually you've not learned anything. You've not gained anything. Your skill set hasn't increased. The difficulty is that you do still give yourself positive feedback by thinking, I'm really clever, I avoided that. So you're... Your pleasure in your skill set, your confidence, your happiness about your skill set to avoid or, or your safety seeking behaviours gets really, really strong. You're really pleased with yourself that you managed to avoid that. And so what happens is you're not learning anything, you're not gaining anything. You're staying that same rigid person that you've been since your childhood. And this is why, of course, the types of symptoms I mentioned a minute ago, ME, post viral fatigue, chronic fatigue, anorexia, OCD, emetophobia, um, these are the hardest things to treat in normal medicine, in normal psychotherapy. These are people that have been very obsessive, very controlling all their lives. They haven't changed months much since they were children because they haven't allowed themselves to expose themselves to different situations and events in order to grow. In terms of symptomology then, we're talking about people that are over-controlling, both of people and of events. They tend to create a tremendous amount of stress very quickly and very easily. Go from 0 to 10 on their stressometer in seconds. Because very quickly they can feel out of control. 
their thinking is extremely catastrophic and negative. They have this problem-solving thinking. And that's a good phrase to, to remember. Problem-solving thinking. They're always looking out for the worst-case scenario in order that they may be able to control or prevent any ensuing emotional pain. Because they don't believe they can take any more pain, they have to attempt to control everything. So all day long, go back to the metaphobe again, 55,000 thoughts a day about problem solving. How can I avoid this? How can I get around that? How can I not do this? How can I find a way of doing that without having to expose myself in that situation? So they get so used to this problem solving thinking, which of course is inherently negative and frightening. You know, and how can I do that without touching that? How can I get out of the house without undoing the door? How can I eat that food without touching, excuse me, without touching this, that or the other? So this problem solving thinking, although it kind of keeps them alive, is actually inherently so negative because you're always looking for danger. You're always finding a way to get away from perceived danger. Thousands of thoughts every day. That's frightening. That's scary. That'd be awful. That'd be terrible. If How can I avoid? How can I get away from? Social anxiety usually plays a very, very big role in these situations, these sorts of people. Because they're very external, they believe that everything's happening to them. And this then obviously creates a strong sense of injustice and victimology. Oh, here we go again. Typical. I knew it wouldn't last. What's the point? If you're very external, particularly around your emotion, every time you feel an emotion or experience an emotion, you believe it's happening to you. If it involves another person, you believe that person is doing it to you. You've made me really upset by saying that. You made me really angry by doing that. You hurt me by saying those things. They have a sense of isolation. Again, because they're very external, they feel it's the world against them. That Everyone's out to get them. Everyone's doing it to them. You have lots of avoidance and safety-seeking behaviour. Like the emetophobe, as I've just said, probably around 90% of their thoughts fall into the above categories. That's around 55,000 thoughts a day, continuously, all day long. What sort of people are we talking about? Who typically? Anorexics, emetophobes, people with OCD, obsessive, perfectionists, sometimes people with things like PTSD, or just real perfectionists that have got that high level of perfectionism and the obsessionality. How do these people get in these situations? Well, essentially, we're talking about people who simply never learn to have any secondary control. They never learn to manage their emotions. Instead, in their childhood, they just learn to run away. They just learn to be controlling. They just learn to have safety-seeking and avoidance behaviours. They avoid talking in English. They avoid singing in singing lessons. They, they, you know, when they had to play guitar during their music lesson, they took that day off. They didn't do it in sports day. They, they got really skillful at avoiding challenging situations, skillful at avoiding exposure type situations, which have actually been really helpful and got them over their problem, but they avoided them. So they just never ra got around to developing secondary control or coping type skills. Primary control then, uh, direct control, this refers to a person's beliefs about their ability to directly control or influence events or behaviours or aspects of their life. That's primary control. Secondary control or coping skills, this refers to a person's beliefs about their ability to cope with or respond to events, behaviours or aspects of their life. This significantly relates to the perceived ability to emotionally tolerate or manage particular events or experiences but can also encompass, encompass perceived ability to take practical action in response to events outside one's control. This relates to resilience and an ability to bounce back from or respond effectively to challenges. So as I just said, secondary control refers to a person's belief about their ability to cope with or respond to events, behaviours, aspects of their life. If you look at this diagram here that you've seen before, you can see that people with an internal locus of control develop coping strategies, allow themselves to expose themselves to difficult or challenging situations, and hence become more internal. You know, they go one way, whereas the external people, particularly the external children, tend to become more external because they don't channel things. 
it's a little bit like positivity and negativity. People that are generally very positive or optimistic but generally become more positive and optimistic because they're looking at their life in a positive and optimistic way. Where people that are negative and pessimistic are looking at their life in a, pe in a negative and pessimistic way and therefore generally become more like that. If you think about the general locus of control scores we get from people, very few people score less than 15. Most people score somewhere between 15 and 25. Very internal people would score less than 5. But very, very few people uh, score between 5 and 15. So it's an inverse bell curve, a little bit like um, the opposite to, say, IQ, where most people are somewhere around 100. That's a bell curve. Very few people down at 60, very few people at 160, that's a bell, a bell-shaped curve. This is an inverse bell curve. Most people are either at the bottom or at the top. In fact, obviously, it's at the top. Most people are external. Very few people are in the middle. That's because internal people tend to become more internal, and external people tend to become more external. So people with these type of symptoms, because they've never never learnt really any secondary control, how to manage their emotions or manage how they react to situations, have stayed as controlling since they were young kids, since they were children. Um, in order to overcome this situation, as you heard with the dogs, it tends to not be that difficult, but it does mean having to force yourself out of your comfort zone, expose yourself to these situations, Get in the right mindset, I can do this, I can overcome this, I can change this, I, I can sustain this situation. If you think about the Stockdale type thinking, you have a realistic appraisal and yet you put in loads of effort. Realistic appraisal and you put in effort. You've got to process experiences effectively. You know, It doesn't matter if you swim the channel, if you're not going to process the fact that you've done that and you've done really well, it might as well not have happened. Uh, most importantly, one needs to build up secondary control, get emotional control, get some stability around the emotions. Stop processing emotions as if they're happening to you and take some responsibility for your emotions and the way you use your emotions and the way you respond to other people and events and build up a much higher secondary control. Think of some things you can do. Think of some exercises you can do to build up your secondary control. Thanks very much.